Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's online Bailey or online lecture series. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Martin Burton, who will be talking about his work as director of Cochrane UK. Now, those of us who know Martin will know that he juggles many roles. I know him most personally as an ex-student in his role as fellow in clinical medicine here at Balliol, and I know firsthand he cares deeply about mentoring the students here. Martin trained in medicine at Cambridge and then Oxford, and then had an international career. He underwent research training as a Fulbright Scholar in the States, and then completed surgical training at London and an, as a fellow at John Hopkins University. Martin is a professor of otolaryngology at Oxford and on, an honorary consultant at the hospitals. Today, Martin will be talking about his work as director of Cochrane UK. He was the founding coordinating editor of Cochrane, and from 2014 to 2020, he served on the governing board and for the last three years as the co-chair of the board. Now, there is an online Q&A feature, um, so we'd invite you to send in your questions during the lecture and there'll be time for a Q&A at the end. So this is going to be a relevant and fascinating talk for all audiences, and I'm delighted to hand over the stage to Professor Martin Burton. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much for those kind words of introduction. I'm going to do what might be the most challenging thing of the evening and try and share my screen now. That's good. That looks like it's going to work. So uh, there we are. Excellent. Can you? I hope you can all see that. Good. Thank you very much. It's great to be here and great to be talking to you about uh, Cochrane. I sometimes say to people that if I was a stick of rock and you broke me in half, you would see the word Cochrane running through the middle. But I'm going to say a little bit about how I got to that point. But before I do that, this is where we're going to start. The story really starts in Salonika in Greece in June in 1941, when a young Scottish doctor who was a medical officer in the British Army was captured in Crete and taken as a prisoner of war to a transit camp in Salonika. And to start with, things weren't too bad in the 200 bedded hospital building he was uh, looking after. But then this young man, who was only 31 years old, became the chief medical officer. And the reason was he spoke fluent German, and this man was Archie Cochran. And then something rather unusual happened, that all the other officers were removed, leaving him as the only officer in charge of 8,000 demoralized, hungry British prisoners of war. And the sorts of things he had to deal with were 80 or so cases of diphtheria, typhoid, sandfly fever, jaundice, a variety of other things, and edema, in other words, swelling, swelling of the, of the limbs. And Cochrane thought that that edema was a disease called wet berry berry, and due to a vitamin deficiency, in fact. So he managed to buy some yeast on the black market, and he then took 20 men and gave them a talk about clinical trials. He put 10 of them in one ward and 10 of them in another, and he gave one group the yeast and the other group a vitamin C tablet. And the orderlies helping Cochrane measured the number of times each man urinated. That's all they could do. They didn't even have buckets, so they couldn't measure the volume of urine. And by the fourth day, there was a difference between the groups was conclusive, less edema in the yeast group. So Cochrane set off to see the German authorities. He told them about clinical trials and he presented the data. And he told them there was a major epidemic due to a diet deficient in vitamin B. And he, he asked for a lot more yeast and more food and he got it and the men uh, got better. Now, interestingly, when Cochrane wrote up this story in the British Medical Journal in, of, in 1984, he said, on reflection, it wasn't a good trial. I was testing the wrong hypothesis. The edema was not wet berry berry. Furthermore, the numbers were too small, the time too short, the outcome measures poor, yet the treatment worked. I still do not know why. And um, he comments there, the German doctor's remark when I asked for more help, was doctors are superfluous. This is probably correct, but it was amazing what a little bit of science and a little bit of luck achieved. And after the war, uh, Cochrane went on and became a chess physician in Wales. And the next key part of his story is in uh, this book, Effectiveness and Efficiency, Random Reflections on Health Services, which he published in 1972. Uh, Cochrane himself 
said that this focused on a simple idea, which was the value of randomized controlled trials in improving the National Health Service in the UK. And interestingly, from my point of view, as an ear, nose and throat surgeon, there were short sections in the book, even, even then on the controversial topic of tonsillectomy and hearing aids in the elderly. And this is perhaps the most important quote from the book. It is surely a great criticism of our profession that we have not organized a critical summary by specialty or subspecialty adapted periodically of all relevant randomized controlled trials. That was what Cochrane said. So let's just hold that thought for a second and we'll come back to Cochrane. So as Gaurav said, when I began my career, I, I did my clinical training here in Oxford. I did one of my house jobs here, but the first place I went to after Oxford was this city, which some of you will recognize as the city of Bristol. And it was in Bristol that I first did any uh, ENT. And I worked for two surgeons at the time uh, named Ken Roddy and Nigel Edwards. And when I was there, I began to appreciate something which I had noticed even as I was a houseman, that sometimes doctors have very different ideas about the best way of treating the same conditions. So I would do one of the consultants clinics and I'd be expected to treat a patient in one way and I do another consultants clinic and I'd be advised to do it in another way. And I couldn't really quite understand this. This didn't really gel with the idea I'd had as a student that we were taught the best way to, to treat people. But what I was witnessing was something which is, is well recognized. And this is something about variation in clinical practice. I like, I like this quote, uh, well-meaning physicians practice locally defined norms of care without sometimes realizing how different their practices are from well-meaning physicians in other communities. And the key thing about this is this idea that these are, physicians do different things, not out of mischief, mischievousness necessarily, but actually well-meaning physicians still can do very different things. And one wonders why that should be, and we'll, we'll come back to that later. After my time in Bristol, I then went to this place. This is the Kresge Hearing Research Institute at the University of Michigan in the United States. And this was my first exposure to laboratory-based science. I was supervised by uh, Professor Joe Miller on the right in this photograph. I worked with uh, Susan Shaw and we did some basic experiments and I began to get a little bit more hands-on experience of the basics of scientific method. I then returned to Oxford, did some jobs uh, here. And whilst I was back in Oxford as a registrar, I had another opportunity to go abroad. And I went to this institution. This is the Royal Victorian Iron Air Hospital in Melbourne in Australia. And I worked for someone whose way of investigating and uh, developing new devices and new techniques was very influential on my, on my life. This is Professor Graham Clark. He invented the cochlear implant, which is one of the most widely used cochlear implants uh, in the world. And from him, I learned many things, but one of them was about the importance of being rigorous in your science. Um, Graham had developed this electronic device, which is threaded into a patient's inner ears so that profoundly and severely deaf people can hear. And I think the reason the scientific endeavors he oversaw were so successful was because of the rigor and stringency with which he did his investigations, always checking that things were not only effective, but also they were safe. And whilst I was there, I wrote my uh, DM thesis on the uh, if safety and efficiency of cochlear implants, particularly in the use of young children. This device was something that had been used to restore hearing to adults and older children, but at the time it wasn't clear how effective or safe it might be in young children. And uh, the bottom line of the work I was involved in was that in fact it is something that can be used safely in children under the age of two, and now many children who are born deaf will be offered cochlear implantation. So I came back from Australia, I worked in London for a while, but always at the back of my mind, I still 
had this question about how one could be certain that the treatments that my well-meaning colleagues were offering to patients were really effective or not. And I eventually arrived back in Oxford as a consultant on the 1st of January in 1996. And at that time, this man was working in Oxford. This is Professor David Sackett. He was a Canadian and he was the first professor here of evidence-based medicine. And he really is one of the fathers or grandfathers of evidence-based medicine. And it was a seminal time to be coming back and starting working in this city. So he and some colleagues published an article in the BMJ where they defined what evidence-based practice was. And here's the definition that they gave uh, in 1996 the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. Doesn't this, that sound fantastic? So here, I was always worried about what, whether I was choosing the right treatments or not on which ones to choose, but here is a description of a process which is conscientious, explicit, but also judicious, which tries to bring to bear the best evidence, whatever it might be, in making decisions about the care of individual patients. This is a classic definition of EBM. There's only one thing that I don't like about it, and it's something I've come to dislike over the last few years, and that is it has, I think some of you might acknowledge, a rather paternalistic doctor knows best feel about it. And I think we're, we're in an era now where sharing decision-making with, with patients is very important. So I think if I dare suggest an improvement, that if we were to change that last part, a better definition now would be the conscientious, explicit and judicious use of current best evidence in helping individual patients make decisions about their care. So if that's what we're trying to do, if that's what evidence-based medical practice is about. Where do we find current best evidence? Well, the short answer is in up-to-date systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials. There is a, a something called the evidence pyramid and the quality of the information on which to make a medical judgment increases as you go towards the top of the pyramid. So at the bottom, we have expert opinion. Then we have information derived from case reports or case control studies. The purple band, randomized control trials. Remember, that's something that Cochrane talked about. And then systematic reviews and meta-analyses above that. And I'm going to go and talk to more about both of those things in the next few minutes. Remember what... Uh, Cochrane, Archie Cochrane had said. Well, here's another man who's been very influential in my life. Uh, Ian Chalmers, now Sir Ian Chalmers. He was one of my predecessors here. He was the first director of Cochrane UK. Ian had the same sort of experiences, I think, as I had when he was a junior doctor, being uncertain whether he was doing more harm than good by giving the treatments that different bosses of his recommended for patients. So Ian set out to see if he could fulfill Archie Cochrane's challenge of identifying all the randomized controlled trials that address topics in the area of pregnancy and childbirth and bring them all together in one place, synthesizing them as best he could. And this is the result of that endeavor. He and a number of colleagues in 1988 produced this two volume tome, Effective Care in Pregnancy and Childbirth. Effectively, these two volumes contain information about all the randomized trials in this area. And they've been collected together by topic, by subtopic, bringing together trials that look at the same condition in the form of a meta-analysis to work out whether or not the treatments are effective. So he did that, that was published in 1988. And then four years later, the first Cochrane Center, 
uh, was opened in Oxford in the building which I'm sitting in as I talk to you uh, at the moment. And a, years, a year later, in 1993, 30 years ago this September, people from all over the world came together at the center from different disciplines to establish the Cochrane Collaboration. And the collaboration is dedicated to synthesizing the evidence from individual studies that address important questions about the healthcare and the decisions that patients and others uh, make. I, I went along to see Ian just after I'd been appointed, I think probably in about 1990s, late 1996. And I said to Ian, Ian, is there an ear, nose and throat disorders group within Cochrane? And Ian said, no, there isn't. And I said, oh, well, maybe I'll come back then when there is. And Ian sort of peered over his glasses and said to me, that's not quite how it works, Martin. I think we ought to encourage you to start one. So the, to cut a long story short, or actually not too long a story, it, it took us a couple of years, but we got together a group of people with an interest in establishing a group within Cochrane dedicated to ear, nose and throat disorders. And that was established in 1998. And you can see Ian at the front there, second from the right, and some of my colleagues who've been part of the Cochrane ENT group since then. So what is this process that I've alluded to, this concept of doing systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials? I often say to trainees and students that it's good to have a little definition of things and a straightforward way to define a systematic review is to say the systematic review attempts to locate, appraise and synthesize evidence from scientific studies. What you're trying to do is find all the evidence that meets pre-specified criteria to answer a given research question using specific methods. But the key really here are these three words, locating, appraising, and synthesizing. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about each of those as we go along. But also what's important is the fact that this can be done in a scientific way. I'm sure many people have at some point in their career, actually, one, one obvious example is when writing an essay uh, as an undergraduate, have collected together information from a variety of sources, which seems to be relevant and germane to, to the question, and then does, do, does some form of appraisal and synthesizes it. And I remember myself years ago as a registrar being asked to write a review for a journal. Um, I would go to the library, I would spend hours photocopying things as we did in those days. I'd lay them out on the dining room table one evening and, and I would try and synthesize them and bring them together in, in a review article. But I did that in a rather random and non-scientific way. The great thing, and the thing that again I find so appealing about systematic review is the fact that we adopt a formal scientific process to do this. Cindy Mulrow, who was involved very early on in the history of Cochrane, said, current medical reviews do not routinely use scientific methods to identify, assess, and synthesize information. And Ian Chalmers himself has made the point, science is supposed to be cumulative, but scientists only rarely accumulate evidence scientifically. I'm going to talk in a moment about the effects of accumulating scientifically and non-scientifically, but before I do that, I need to introduce you to the idea of a, a forest plot. And this is a simple forest plot. Um, I'm going to go through it in a little bit more detail. But what it's effectively doing is showing you the results from a set of six trials and then performing a meta-analysis to mathematically combine the results of those trials. So let's go through this bit by bit. So at the top, there is information about what this particular chart is looking at. It's a label that tells you what is being compared 
and what the outcome is. So in this case, this is looking at giving patients antibiotics when they're having a particular type of ear surgery, and it's comparing the effects of antibiotics on whether or not the patient gets a post-operative infection within the three weeks uh, after surgery. So that's the label which has a standard sort of format. Each line in the forest plot represents a study and the study is identified in this case, and often it is the case by the name of the first author of the journal article where the study was published and the year of publication. So Bagger, Shellback, 1987. You then have the data for each trial in terms of the treatment group and the control group. So here you have nine infections out of 47 patients in the treatment group, 10 infections out of 44 in the control group. And then to the right, you have a figure giving the weight that the study is given when the analysis was uh, pooled, when the six studies were pooled together. There's also a, a line here. This is sometimes called a dot and whisker plot, uh, not so much a dot, more of a square in this case. Um, there's a label telling you what the statistical test is. In this case, we're looking at something called an answer ratio. And each study is given a blob placed where the result of the analysis lies. And the size of the blob is proportional to the weight. And the horizontal line pre pre it represents a 95% confidence interval to give you some idea of how certain you can be about the result. And in fact, you don't need to try and work out with your eye where that blue square is and where the whiskers go, because the numbers are actually given on the right-hand side. So the blue square is at the position 0.81, and the whiskers go from 0.29 to 2.22. At the bottom of the plot, there's a horizontal line. That's a scale measuring the treatment effect. And in this case, the outcome is the effect of antibiotics on post-operative infection, and lower is better. And higher. And the vertical line in the middle is where the treatment and the control have the same effect and where there'd be no difference between the two. The diamond represents the pooled analysis, what you get when you add up the results of all six of those studies. The fat middle part of the diamond is the sort of point estimate, the best guess, if you like, for the actual effect when you pull the studies and the width of the diamond in this case is the 95% confidence interval and in terms of interpretation it's important to realize that if the confidence interval crosses the line of no effect that's equivalent to saying that we haven't found a statistically significant difference in the effects of the two interventions. So there's our picture again you can see there six studies given different weights when you add up the results, you get the results in the diamond. The diamond, the, the fat part of the diamond is at 0.73, but the width of the diamond is such that it crosses the line of no effect. So let's come back to this point about accumulating scientifically, and let me show you a much larger forest plot. What you have here are about 30 odd studies that all looked at the effect of giving patients who had had a heart attack an injection of something called streptokinase. And as you can see here, there are lots and lots of studies starting in the late 1950s with some small studies, some huge studies there in 1986, a study with 11 and a half thousand patients and another huge study in 1988. So, over this period from 1959 to 1988, there were trials that altogether included 36,974 patients. And in this case, rather than a diamond, there is actually a, um, a, a simple, so when they're all added together, the results are shown as a dot. And if you can see where it says on the total 36974, take your eye to the right there and just above the the, the final T of treatment, you will see a dot. And that is the result of adding up all the trials that had been done to that point. The whiskers are so small, you can barely see them on the slide. But the key point here is that this dot is to the left of the line. 
So when you add up the results of all of these studies, it is the case that more people survive, more people live than die if you have um, an injection of intravenous streptokinase when you've had an acute myocardial infarction, otherwise known as a heart attack. So that seems all very well. It's great, you know, we've, we've added all of these this information up. We now have a degree of certainty about the effectiveness of this treatment that, that the, the single trials didn't necessarily give us. But what I'm going to do now is focus on an expanded version of the middle section of this chart. So just to be clear here, on the right in the right-hand panel, the width of the chart goes from 0.5 to 2. So it's an expanded look at the middle section of the panel on the left. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a cumulative meta-analysis. Rather than waiting till the end to add up all the results of the studies, we're going to add up as we go along. So the first 23 patients in the first study are added to the second 42 patients in the second study to make 65 in total. Then we add in the next 167 patients, then the next 730 and uh, so forth. And what you will see here is that as you do that, the, the point estimate that the blob moves around a little bit, but the, the confidence interval, the whiskers get shorter and shorter and shorter as you become more certain of your treatment effect. And in fact, as long ago as 1973, after 2,432 patients had had this treatment and been investigated, it was statistically significant that more people survived if they had intravenous streptokinase. All that happened as time went on was you got more and more and more certain about, about that result. So you might say to yourself, if someone had bothered to add up the results of the first trials in 1973, would they have gone on and done all these other studies? This is what I mean about the importance of accumulating information in a scientific uh, way. You would know in this day and age, you wouldn't get ethical committee approval to do a study if you hadn't already done a systematic review like this to see if the answer was known already. And nor would you get funding to do it from any of the major funding agencies. Why did people do all these studies from 1973 to 1988? It's easy to be cynical about some of the reasons, but it's actually quite serious, isn't it? Because the patients that were involved in those studies were told when they gave informed consent to be in those trials that the answer wasn't known and they were going to be helping mankind uh, find an answer to this question. Whereas in fact, the answer was already known with some degree of certainty. I, I give you this and I show you this just to demonstrate the importance of doing a systematic review, looking back at all the pre-existing evidence before you start embarking on new studies. So that's what a systematic review is, locates, finds all the studies, appraises them, and then synthesizes them when it's a right to do so in the form of meta-analysis that I've just um, shown you. Let me give you a, an, an, an example. Um, there is something called a PICO. Uh, PICO stands for Participants, Intervention, Comparator and Outcome, the initial letters of the words you see on the slide here. A PICO is a good way of defining all the elements of the sort of question that a systematic review could answer. So for example, in children with recurrent tonsillitis or sore throats, is tonsillectomy better than watchful waiting in reducing a number of sore throat episodes? I think you can see there that this defined the sorts of trials we'd be looking for if we were doing this systematic review, and we have actually done this systematic review, we'd be looking for trials where children were randomized to receive either tonsillectomy or watchful waiting. And what we'd be looking at is whether that reduced the number of sore throat episodes that they, they had. And this in fact is the systematic review that addressed that topic. I have to say, um, for a while I was the, at least popular ENT surgeon in the world for writing this review, because um, a lot of time energy has been spent, is spent doing tonsillectomy. And uh, many children of my ENT surgical colleagues have been fed and clothed 
as a result of the money that their parents have earned doing this procedure. But that's another story, perhaps for another day. Overall, over the last few years, we have done over 100 reviews and, and several suites of reviews looking at different topics within uh, ENT. What do these things look like when we write a Cochrane review? What, what, what do the results look like? Well, we, we, we give people the sorts of forest plots that I've shown you already, but we also produce tables like this, which are designed to summarize for the reader the different outcomes we've been looking at, some idea of the certainty of the evidence. I haven't spoken very much about this, but something we can pick up in questions if people are interested, but there is a method of appraising the quality of the evidence. It's called the GRADE system, capital G-R-A-D-E, and we can tell the reader of the review whether we are certain, high, with high certainty, moderate certainty, low certainty, or only very low certainty about the strength of the evidence. Um, here's another example here of a study we looked at where antibiotics were being compared with placebo. And you can see how, as well as looking at the benefits of treatment, a review also looks at the adverse effects. You can see those listed, for example, sort of here. So let me just say, as I'm sort of finishing a bit more about, about Cochrane, because this is what we do. We do systematic reviews predominantly of randomized trials. And as many of you might know, Cochrane has become well known in this field. It's a, it's a UK charity. Uh, it's established as a UK charity, but it's a not-for-profit organization. And it's fiercely independent. We are very particular in not taking funding from any drug or device companies and making sure that the people who write the reviews are also independent. And Cochrane now covers all topics in healthcare and it publishes the reviews online in an electronic database as part of the uh, Cochrane Library. Now, if you are watching this talk in the UK, in other words, you have a UK IP address, the British government subscribes to the Cochrane Library on behalf of everybody in the UK. And so if you're a UK uh, listener tonight, you can Google the Cochrane Library and you have full access to it. It's provided free of charge in all low and middle income countries around the world. But in high income countries, it depends whether there, there's sometimes there's a national license, other times there isn't and you'd have to go and access it by your university or via another uh, library. It's a, now a huge network with people in over 130 countries, over 30,000 members. And these are people of all sorts, people who do the reviews themselves, people who promote the reviews, people who try and take the results of reviews and make them accessible to a wider uh, readership and, and audience. In Cochrane UK, I have colleagues who produce blogs, and this is an example of the sort of thing that we do. We take the results of Cochrane reviews that are relevant to people in the UK, and we disseminate them by making them accessible to a variety of different consumers, including, really importantly, to patients. This is an example of the sort of blog shots that we produce, where we try and summarize evidence in a format that can be tweeted or blogged. Uh, and this, this is the sort of thing that we, we produce. We're also very keen to engage with the wider public. So we have an engagement program that works with nurses, midwives, other allied health professions and with students. So just as an example, we have a series called Evidence for Everyday Nursing where we take Cochrane reviews that are relevant to nurses and summarize the content. Here's one, for example, on the evidence about replacing peripheral venous uh, catheters. And uh, here's another one about fetal movement um, counting. As, as Gurath knows, I'm enthusiastic about uh, students. We established a, an online community called Students for Best Evidence. And again, you can just type this into your browser, s4be.org. And 
This is a community of students around the world, medical students, healthcare students, any student really, and the students who are part of this community not only promote and comment on Cochrane reviews, but they write short articles on blogs, on statistical topics, methodological topics and research. And there's now a Spanish version of this and soon to be a Portuguese version of it um, as well. But we particularly wanted to take Cochrane, and I've, it's been one of the things I've been very keen on over the years, to take these ideas about what evidence-based medicine is and what evidence-based practice is beyond the community of um, healthcare professionals. Cochrane reviews are key substrates for guidelines, they inform practice, they can inform research. But I've been, I've really wanted a broader group of the population to know what evidence-based practice is and what a systematic review is so that people can make better health-related choices. But also, I think, for, for another reason, that this epithet, evidence-based, is now cropping up all over the place, isn't it? Evidence-based uh, healthcare might be one thing, but uh, there's evidence-based policing, evidence-based justice, evidence-based climate change, evidence-based, all sorts of things. So I do think it's important that people understand some of the uh, principles. As part of that outreach, my colleague uh, Linda Ware, who, who is a retired local GP, has taken talks out to a number of communities. So for example, the University of the Third Age and some WI groups are just two examples. And you can go to these pages on our website and you can look at these things yourself, but trying to bring to the community information about what evidence-based medicine is and why it's important and where people can find out about it. We've had an outreach program to uh, schools. We used to get, this is, this is me talking to a group of students who came into the office pre-COVID. If there are any silver linings to COVID, one of them for us has been the fact that we've been able to take the program online. And we now have a program, we go out to schools virtually around the country, teaching pupils in years nine to 13, about what evidence-based practice is. And we, this is just another picture of one of our interactive workshops. We've also focused particularly on providing these for students who might be interested in careers of any sort uh, in, 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 uh, in healthcare. This slide just tells you a little bit about the sorts of things that, that we're doing with them. We set up a page, some resources here for pupils and students interested in it. And again, I'd be very happy to talk more about this, but if any of you are interested, please do check out this information we have for the schools. Uh, not only students interested in studying healthcare, but actually anybody interested in uh, their owns of health. We've also done some of this, in fact, in conjunction with Pravahi, the outreach officer at Balliol, as part of Balliol's outreach endeavours. So look, I'm just looking at the clock and I can see that time is rather running away with us. So I think I should perhaps stop there. I, I put this slide up just again to remind me to make that point about this phrase, evidence-based. We hear a lot about it in all sorts of aspects of life. And I think it's really important that we are clear what it means. And for me, it, in any domain, this is about the conscientious, explicit use of current best evidence, whatever that evidence might be. And I grant you that not in many cases, there isn't evidence from systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials, but it's about that conscientious, explicit, judicious use of evidence in making the best decisions. Evidence about what works, what doesn't work, what the benefits of an intervention of any sort might be, or a policy even, and what the downsides uh, might be. But I'm going to stop there and uh, hand you back to Gurav. And Gurav, let's see if we have any questions. Martin, thank you so much for such a fascinating talk. Um, you've walked us through the amazing narrative of your career, both from the clinical and research journeys and how that led you to evidence-based medicine, 
you've given us a very structured way to think about evidence and broken down very complex uh, topics into very accessible ways. Uh, and it's been clear that Cochrane has benefited from your leadership uh, in this important practice changing work. Um, I would just like to kick off with a question myself, um, and there are plenty of questions coming in on the chat. Um, do feel free to post questions on the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, we'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, so Martin, I was wondering how you see machine learning changing the way we synthesize the increasing amount of evidence we have. Mm -hmm. That's a really, a really interesting question because there are some parts of the process I've described in locating all the studies and then appraising them and extracting data from them which are very labor intensive. And that it is undoubtedly the case that machine learning will be a help in, in that, re that regard. Uh, and there are already steps being taken in that. But the, as in so many things, the most difficult thing actually is getting the question right in the first place. And you know, this is garbage in, garbage out, isn't it? You know, you've, if you've got to get the question right in the first place, and then knowing what to do with the answer when you when you get it. So I think that there are, there are lots of places in this process where machine learning, if it is shown to be efficient and effective enough, and that's something that can be evaluated by comparing it with doing the same thing in a non-machine learning way. I think there are, there are plenty of opportunities where where it will be it will be helpful. But it's not the most difficult part of the endeavor, really. It is the most time consuming part, but not the most difficult part. Amazing. And we have um, a flood of questions coming in. So uh, I'll start from the top. Um, we have a question from Paul Kenny on does health policy generally reflect the conclusions of meta analyses? Absolutely not. Should it? Yes, it probably should at least reflect um the conclusions if not a meta-analysis of some sort of appraisal of current uh best best evidence so um we are we are, we are uh, hopeful we're all hopeful in the evidence-based community that that one day more decisions will be made on the basis of better quality uh, evidence but it's certainly not the case that we're there uh, yet I would say that, of course, this doesn't, as I've tried to allude to already, this doesn't just apply to health policy, but to policy in general. And just as a, an, an aside, um, the master and I and a colleague, Jonathan Shepard, convened a meeting at Balliol uh, about a year ago, just under a year ago now, of leaders, government leaders from different parts of the civil service and, uh, and so forth, looking at how the principles of evidence-based medical practice might also apply in, in those, those sectors, uh, which uh, Gus O'Donnell, the former cabinet secretary, kindly came and chaired. So there's, there is an interest in applying these principles uh, elsewhere. And I think that that's obviously to be applauded. Hmm. Next question we have is from John Scampion. That's, does, Co does Cochrane methodology take account of varying amounts of resource used in particular treatments in assessing their relative efficacy? Um, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, varying amount of resources used in particular treatments in assessing their relative efficacy? Yes and no. So th this is part of a process with a number of steps to it. What, what this, a systematic view of randomized control trials is looking, in a sense, at whether something works under ideal conditions and ideal trial settings, whereas a, you know, real life is different. So you have to take that in, into account when looking at, at how you put the results of a systematic review into practice. You'll also find often that the systematic review might help you make some decisions and, and write guidelines, for example, but doesn't necessarily give you all the information that you need. There might be gaps uh, in the evidence. And if, if you're a, a healthcare provider, you would or might also be interested in an economic evaluation or a resource evaluation, looking at not just the pros and cons of treatment under ideal conditions, but what the different resource implications 
uh, of those. And I should just say that Cochrane being a global organization, it writes its reviews with a global audience in mind. So Cochrane reviews do not make recommendations because, but they, they can form the substrate for recommendations and guidelines. And that's because context as in so many things is everything and different in different contexts, different resources, different, different settings, different communities with different, with their own values uh, and priorities, the results might be used in a different way. So they form a building block, but, but Cochrane itself is relatively narrow in, in simply being able to say, we've taken the evidence, this is this dear reader is the evidence as we found it from the trials. And then the reader has to then take that and process it in whichever way they want to do so. Mm. And given those substrates of evidence, um, question from Stephen West, do you find that NICE makes use of Cochrane in its decision-making process for the NHS? Yes, it does a lot. So we, we, if you go to the Cochrane Library, for each review, you can see which guidelines, both NICE and the guidelines from the other the devolved administrations of the UK, but which global guidelines reviews are being used, used in. We've got a very good relationship for, with NICE. I hope cemented by the fact that I had Sam Roberts, the CEO of NICE, to dinner on Balliol High Table only a term ago uh, to try and keep those uh, wheels moving smoothly. But, but no, NICE are interested in high quality systematic reviews and particularly interested in Cochrane reviews. Mm. Um, and there's two questions that are linked. Um, so Jonathan K has a question on, uh, can you comment on the different as different impact of evidence-based medicine in different areas of healthcare? Then Joe asks if there's room for Cochrane to deal with uh, public health and prevention, uh, as well as the treatment aspect of healthcare. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So just down to the second one first. Yes, you can do systematic reviews. I, I, I focus in a sense on what we've done most of in Cochrane ENT, which is systematic reviews of treatments. But you can have systematic reviews of diagnostic test accuracy, systematic reviews of prognostic studies. Uh, you can look at prevention strategies as well as treatment, treatment strategies. This overarching process of locating, appraising, and synthesizing in a predetermined scientific way can be applied to anything. And it doesn't have to be just applied to randomized controlled trials. It can be applied to non-randomized studies as well. But the caveat is that we know from uh, long experience that if you want to minimize bias, randomization and therefore randomized trials are the best way of minimizing bias. You, 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 you can be less certain about the veracity of the results when you have a systematic review of non-randomized studies compared to randomized ones. But that might be the best you have. Remember that there's nothing in the definition of EBM about randomized controlled trials. It talks about current best evidence. And the current best evidence might be evidence from non-randomized uh, studies. And just looking back at Jonathan Kay's question, any overview comments about the different impacts in different areas of, of healthcare? I think it has impacted, definitely impacted some areas more than others partly depending on how much evidence there is to start with. When I used to talk to people about evidence-based ENT surgery, they thought it was some sort of oxymoron really to, to start with. And it, and it was true, we weren't a discipline which had very much hard evidence. We didn't have so many randomized controlled trials as some other medical disciplines did, for example. But the great thing about this process is it's a hypothesis generating exercise if you have an important clinical question and you find that the level of current best evidence is, is poor, then we should be going on to do the trials. I have to say, Gaurav, I, I rather got stuck in systematic reviews. I thought that I would start doing some reviews, then I'd become a trialist. 30 years later, I've, I've never really got beyond the systematic review, review stage. But, but yes, there are, there, the EBM has had different impact not least in some part because of the different levels of evidence and quality of evidence that's available in different disciplines. Yeah, and um, that ties into Tim's question on what do you count as evidence in the first place? Yeah. And how, how, how stringent are you with um, filtering out what you put into your forest block? 
Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I'm just looking at Tim's question. It, it's it's a very, very good good question because we, we know that from long experience that from, the, from trial methodology uh, is robust in medicine. Um, the thing is though, actually, you can use the same methodologies in other areas. It's just that people haven't in the past always done that. So the, the cabinet office ha, ha, runs a thing called set, set of things called the What Work Centers. You've probably heard of you know, the David Halpern who, who runs the, uh, the nudge unit, that, that behavioral, the behavioral insights team. The government, government is very keen to promote a culture of trials across the civil service, for example, because there are ways in which you can generate better quality evidence than a hitherto for. Um, and in fact, that, that was something I was involved myself in a, a few years, years ago. Um, yeah, I, I, the quality of evidence in other disciplines can be better, but we need, you need to think about it. You need to think, what, what's the quality of the evidence we've got? Do we need to have better quality evidence? Now, having said that, what you if in this resource limited environment we're in, what quality of evidence is enough and proportionate to the question that you're addressing is also an important one. I don't want people to go away thinking, ah, oh, he was promoting randomized trials and would have us do randomized controlled trials in everything. Absolutely not. They're expensive, they're difficult, um, they're not the right methodology necessarily. But for any particular question, you have to think what the right type of evidence is and what the best is that you can generate in the circumstances. Just, I'm just looking back at that question again from Tim. Um, yeah, what counts as evidence? Well, the answer is it, var it varies, but it's something that can be defined. Mm. Um, and then when you're faced with lots of evidence, then one problem that I guess you might have is there are differences in the cohorts and not all trials are completely identical. So Andrew has a question on how do you decide which trials to include in that situation or control for those differences? Yes, yeah, so this, this is a really interesting question. So you, you can have a very, very, very focused clinical question or you can have a very broad clinical question. So for example, you could say, do antibiotics help people with chest infections? And you could have all the trials that have randomized people to receive any antibiotic of any sort versus placebo for any sort of chest infection. And that's, a, that's what's called lumping as opposed to splitting. And if you, if you did that, it would, that was probably far too big an endeavor but you might or might not demonstrate across that broad field that antibiotics generally help people with chest infections. Or you have a very narrow question, which does amoxicillin help males, male smokers between the age of 60 and 80 with low bar pneumonia? That is a very, very narrow, narrow question. In that case, you'd be looking for trials that just looked at that particular type of participant. In other words, you'd be trying to find trials which only included people like that and only gave them that sort of therapy. Now, for the purpose of effect, I've given you two rather extreme, extreme examples. You have to define a question which is relevant. And of course, if you define it too narrowly, you won't find any studies that, um, that address it. So defining the question, as I said at the beginning, is very important. But what's also important, and in a sense, this is where the art and skill of medicine comes in, is that if you know that a systematic review has looked at a particular question and you have a patient in front of you and you and the patient are trying to make a decision, and this patient, she is, she is slightly different from the people that were included in the trials, you have to ask yourself, is that difference enough that actually it would probably be unwise to, to, to suggest this treatment, or is she sufficiently similar to the participants in the systematic review and the trials that actually it would be, it would be sens sensible? And that's where common sense, medical experience, and understanding of pathophysiological principles uh, comes to bear, uh, uh, bear, bear as well. So is it fair to say that the evidence is, is there as a guide and you have to know when to break the evidence for your specific patient? 
Yeah, well, yes. So, so the evidence is there as a guide. I mean, and, and the evidence, as I said a few times, under, often underpins guidelines, and guidelines are just that, they're a guide. Um, we could have a, you and I probably talked about this before, we could have a conversation about whether or not the guideline movement is good, or, or it, is, it, it is good, essentially. I don't want to, to give the impression, but, but, but this idea of the slavish and uncritical following of guidelines might be, be problematic, might it not? And so actually knowing when to follow guidelines and when not to follow guidelines is really important part of medical practice uh, as well. And it involves, again, a, a good understanding of patients, their, their, their beliefs, their values, biological differences, and so forth. Mm. David has a question. Um, his daughter's studying medicine now in year six. Is Cochrane relevant for her? And if so, how can she get yes. involved? Well, firstly, send me an email, but also we'll sign her up for students for, for best evidence. I think she will. Um, I'm sure she will have come across the Cochrane Library in her training. But but yes, very, uh, very happy to do that. that. That's the same. If anybody, I have a, I have a traditional Balliol email address. So I make the offer to any of the listeners here. If there's any more that you'd like to know about this, or anyone likes to be involved. And in fact, you can all be involved. Cochrane is very keen to have consumers and uh, both, both patients and carers and parents, all of those groups involved. There's a big consumer network within the organization and particularly people who might have an interest in this sort of thing. So if anyone's interested, please let me know. Um, David White has a question on accessibility of the evidence um, guidelines you do make. So how, how can we make this? Um, is there a movement to make it more available to developing countries outside the UK without a license fee, for example? What was this? Well, so just to be clear, it is available. This is available free in all low and middle income countries. That's part of Cochrane's um, charitable sort of endeavor. So this is or this is already um, uh, available. Um, uh, uh, so David's question, I think, is more yeah. on access to published academic papers. Academic papers, yes. Well, of course, you know, we're entering this world of, of, of open, ac open access and open access uh, publishing. Cochrane aims to be entirely open access to the whole world by 2025. Uh, um, I think it's interesting. Isn't it? So it seems to me that, that any studies involving patients should always be open, open access. I mean, patients agree to be involved in studies, usually 99.9% .9 of the time, because they, they're doing it for altruistic reasons. There's a small number of times when people get paid to be in studies, but, but, but usually not. So they have altruistic reasons for doing it. And they would reasonably expect, would they not, that the results of the trials would be, would be, would be published. And actually, while I'm on this hobby horse, I mean, there, there's been recent changes and proposed legislation to make sure that all publicly funded trials will have all the results published in the UK going forward. Um, if anyone's interested in that as a, as, a, as a phenomenon, you can look at the All Trials uh, website. It's something I feel particularly personally in, uh, interested in because I am actually myself aware of trials that have been undertaken in the NHS, funded by the National Institute of Health Research, so the UK taxpayer, where uh, the results still have not been published. And I, that's, that's really a travesty. So uh, there are many people in the UK working towards this idea that all trials will be published and, and at least even if they can't be published in a peer-reviewed journal, at least the, all the data. Whose data are they? Um, I've always thought it sounds like the title of a book or a play, doesn't it? Whose data, whose data are they are they anyway? To my mind, they're the patient's data. And really, if you're a patient, you should expect the results to be available for other people to use. And one final aside on that topic, there is good evidence that if you're in a randomized controlled trial, on average, you get better quality treatment. So any of our listeners tonight who are ever invited to be in a trial, you do think about saying yes, because on average, the standard of your treatment will be better. Ian Chalmers even has made himself a randomize me card, which rather like a donor card, which he keeps in his wallet so that if he gets admitted to hospital and he's unconscious, 
he'll be randomized in a trial. So I leave that to people with an, as an idea for them as well. Um, Martin, I had another question. I'm going to abuse my position to ask you a second question, which is how, how can we communicate evidence better to the general public? I liked the um, very digestible, bloggable versions of the evidence cards that you have. How yeah. can we make something that's patient friendly? Yeah. So the question really, I think, is, is, is where do you begin in all of this? This is why we're interested in working with, with school, school children, actually, because, um, and again, it is another of the silver linings, the few silver linings of the COVID pandemic, I think. I mean, who would have imagined that people would know about so much now about trials as they do because of the trials they've heard of as part of the pandemic? So I think we ought to be building on that and making the public as, as knowledgeable as possible about the principles of trials. And um, that even at key stage two, children are introduced to the idea of, of fair testing. And there are certainly some of us who've tried to influence government and the Department of Education in, in all of this to make it something that becomes part of every child's education in the UK. So they have a better understanding about how to evaluate something and understand a bit more about certainty and uncertainty. And I don't mean that everyone should understand the nuances of statistics, although I appreciate that the government have talked a lot recently about, about mathematical skills, but it's, it is just some basic knowledge of how you evaluate the effectiveness of something. And also some basic information about the, again, I think people are more aware of this with COVID, about the fact that any treatment might, a treatment might have a benefit, but almost every treatment carries some risk. And so it's about people learning how to weigh up the pros and cons of risk. I think people need to be uh, mathematically, I do think they should need to be mathematically a bit more uh, literate. And if I had time, I should give you I could give you some scary information about illiterate doctors, but maybe that's a talk for another day. And we have time for just one last question. So Gavin asks, do professional bodies such as ENT UK approach Cochrane before undertaking major projects to determine if evidence is already there? Um they mm, that's that that's that's in interesting. Um they don't always approach Cochrane, but then I'm not sure we necessarily know, know that they would. What we hope is that when people are thinking about a project or a trial, that they will look up and see that if a good quality systematic review has been done, um, uh, done, done somewhere. And this, the, the question, and thank you, Gavin, for, for the, the question, so suggests that there's an important piece of work for us to do across all disciplines about prioritizing research. There's lots of research that can be done and could be done, but the question to my mind, and again, in this resource limited environment that we're bound to be in, and we're bound to be, always be in for the foreseeable future, what are the most important questions? Do we have an answer to those questions already? And if we don't have an answer to the questions, what sort of studies should be being done to answer those, those questions. Um, there are organizations that think in this way, but I think the more that we can think of this way sort of across the whole of the medical community and society, then the better. Fantastic. And I think we're on time for questions. Um, so we'll end there, but uh, Martin, thank you so much for speaking with us today and giving up your time. And thank you all for coming. Before you go, I would just like to advertise the next of the Baleo Online Lecture Series, which will be on the 18th of May. Uh, and that will be the Omar Asfar Online Lecture uh, by, given by Professor Laurie Balfour. And the title of their talk will be Modern Life Begins with Slavery, Tony Morrison and the Imagination of Freedom. So that's the, that's the 18th of May at five o'clock on Zoom. And uh, the host will, will put those details on the chat uh, for you to have a look at. Um, so, Martin, again, thank you so much for your talk. It's, it's, um, been, a, it's been a great pleasure. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks. Lovely. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.